There are some stories that can never be told. This is one of them. Not with these pictures, or these pictures, or a million more. And not with words either, not these words or any others. It is all too much. A calamity of such epic proportions, so massive in size and scope, the truth of it is far beyond journalism's reach. A million and a half Rwandans, nearly 20% of the country's entire population, trying desperately to survive one more day in this relentlessly inhospitable corner of Zaire. It is not like the famine in Somalia. It is not like the flight of the Iraqi Kurds into the mountains of Iran and Turkey. It is not like the siege of Sarajevo or the plight of Bosnians displaced by that war. It is not like anything I've ever seen in 30 years as a reporter. It is, I think, the standard against which all future tragedies will be measured. For all up and down this road, this road that leads north from the border, there is madness and horror beyond telling, beyond belief. We're exposed to, to death every day and night. It's a desperation they read on all the faces here. In yours too. Yeah, mine too. This is Eve, one of the hundreds of thousands of Rwandans now living, or at least trying not to die, on the road from Goma. He's 21. A few weeks ago, he was a student. But as the rebel army advanced, he fled with the rest of his family, walked three days across Rwanda to Zaire, running from death, to death. His elderly parents are weak and hungry, his brother is already dead, and Eve, who hasn't eaten in several days, is stoic about his own survival. I know that today if I don't uh, kick the bucket for the disease, I can kick the bucket for hunger. Because till now, nothing has done to, be, to, to save all these people. That's not exactly true. Humanitarian groups like Medecien Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, are doing what they can, which isn't much, with what they have, which is very little. And Eve works in the MSF clinic by the side of the road, trying not to think about home. Would you go back? When? Nowadays, I don't think so, because uh, they, we are afraid to return there. If we return, we know that we will we'll be killed, we will be displayed, and no one will survive. So we prefer to stay here and uh, be killed by the disease what and the hunger. What is your attitude towards This is the land Eves now calls home. It's volcanic rock. You can't farm it, you can't build on it, you can't live on it. You can die on it, but they can't bury you in it which is why the road from Goma is littered with bodies, taken out each morning like Africa's trash, to be collected each day, then dumped in deep trenches now overflowing. 2,000 Rwandans, 2,000 human beings are dying each day now from dysentery, dehydration, and cholera. That's more than one every minute. By the end of this broadcast, 40 more will be gone, and tomorrow morning, their bodies will join the others by the side of the road. On the road north from the Rwandan border, the smoke rises and holes over the lunar landscape of eastern Zaire, a funeral shroud woven from a million campfires. The trees are vanishing fast, and all day, every day, the smoke blends acridly with the foul odor of human waste and the sickeningly sweet stench of death. The air is thick with it, the nostrils choked with it, and still the river of refugees flows from the chaos of their country to the catastrophe of this. This is Andre Mutsitsi, the map of Africa on his face. He's on the road because, like most of the others, he was certain he'd be killed in Rwanda. He's lived 65 years. He's a farmer, or was, that is, and the patriarch of a family so large he cannot remember the number. 
They're all headed 15 miles past the first big camp to this one. It is even more enormous, more malevolent than the other. And this is Andre's destination. He's in a hurry. He believes he's saving his family. He says he was sure he would be killed if he stayed. When was the last time you had something to eat? The last meal was last week. He's living on water. Does he have water? They are trying to get water from the lake, but whenever they drink it, people become sick. Another stop on this wretched road. Lake Kivu, cool and inviting, but contaminated now by these multitudes of refugees gathered here like so many vacationers at some island resort and thousands more trek the road for hours and miles every day to fill their cans and take them back to their families in the camps. They do not know what they've done to the water. They drink it as though it were pure. It is pure poison. In a yellow can balanced nicely on the head of Makusa. She's 15 and so far the healthiest member of her large family which is why it's her job to come to Lake Kivu for the water. Why did you leave Rwanda? There were many bombs falling and they ran away. Do you want to go home? I can't go back, she says, and turns back up the road toward her family, bearing the water that will eventually kill them all. But at least Mokusa does have a family. These Rwandan children do not. They're orphans. They have no one. They have nothing, except a cracker now and then from a French soldier and a bit of shade for sleeping beneath the soldier's truck. It's only a few feet away from these boys dying in the sun. It might as well be a mile. They can't make it. They won't make it. They're beyond help. This small group of orphans has made it this far down the road and stopped hard by the Goma airport, just a football field away from the help that's trickling in. Though for 15-year-old Sheka and the others, it might as well be on the other side of the world. Sheka, what happened to your father and your mother? Sheka, they died. When they started shooting, I ran. The others died, and I was safe. The others included not merely his parents, but six brothers and three sisters as well. All killed, he says, by soldiers of the RPF, the Rwandan Patriotic Front, the new government of his country, mainly Tutsis. Do you know the Tutsis? Yes. Do you like the Tutsis? <laughs> yes. Do you have any friends who are Tutsis? My mother was a Tutsi. Now a few thousand Rwandans, most of them Tutsis, are headed back. Back to the same old country with a brand new government represented at the border by Lieutenant Peter Karaki of the RPF. He cannot believe anyone would be frightened of coming home. But they say they're afraid you guys are going to kill them. Do you believe it? Well, I'm just, I'm asking the questions here, Peter. <laughs> no, we are not going to kill anybody. They are very welcome, including those who have committed crime. We are not going to kill anybody. Of, if somebody has committed crime, he's going to be taken to court, an independent court. Otherwise, one is our welcome would want them back. Lieutenant Karaki and I joined a group of Rwandans, mostly Tutsis, who had just crossed the border, heading so back home through. to an uncertain future. Are you prepared, uh, are you prepared to feed people as they come through here, if you, get, uh, if you get a large number? We are prepared to share with them the ritual we have. Which isn't much, but some are coming back, and those who are don't seem to care about food or water, or even the threat of death. That's not the problem, in fact, being afraid or not. 
the problem is to go back because there's no way of living here. These are desperate people, of course, but they are also quite remarkable. For there is much courage here, and grit, and determination, and faith. Does he think he will make it home? If God helps, he may reach home. But those who are going back are but a minuscule drop from the vast ocean of those who have no intention of leaving Zaire. For them, the road leads in only one direction, out of Rwanda and into this unspeakable horror.